everybody. Welcome to session 114 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. In these unprecedented times of social isolation, public education has made a rapid shift towards a distance learning model. It's probably not a surprise that outcomes will vary for students based on a myriad of factors. And if you'd like to become more involved in your child's educational progress to ensure their success, then this is the podcast for you. Amy Evans, an expert in instructional design and precision teaching, joins me in session 114 to discuss how setting up brief practice sessions with your learner can really enhance not only skill acquisition, but retention too, which in my experience is an often overlooked outcome measure. Long story short, the goal of this conversation is to provide parents practical tips on what we know about learning using readily available materials, in other words, stuff that's downloadable. We did our best to keep the podcast jargon free, and I'm hoping that this podcast will reach a wider audience beyond my usual listeners. To that end, your help with this will be greatly appreciated. If you find this information helpful, please feel free to share it with friends and colleagues. If your acquaintances are not podcast listeners, I'd like to use this as an opportunity to remind folks that every podcast I publish gets posted to YouTube. And I know for some, that's a more convenient medium for listening. Okay, back to the show itself. I think the best part of what we talk about here is just the idea that there are so many freely available or inexpensive materials out there for parents to use, and many of them are downloadable in nature. So to that end, the show notes for this episode will be particularly handy as we have the links for all the things we talk about waiting, waiting just for you at behavioralobservations.com. And if you want to take a deeper dive into precision teaching, or if you're just looking for other CE topics, Central Reach has opened up their online library to all BCBAs at no charge through April 30th. This is not a sponsored plug. They're really doing something amazing to support the field, and I want to share it. So for more info, go to centralreach.com forward slash business dash continuity. And in case you're worried, we actually do have sponsors for this episode. Session 114 is brought to you by the ABA Marketing Minute with Rich Brooks. Digital marketing guru and two-time guest Rich Brooks and I have teamed up to provide listeners with 60-second micro lessons in digital marketing. You'll hear the first installment later on in this broadcast, so I won't spoil it here. But let's just say the message should parallel a lot of what we should strive for in our clinical practice. We're also brought to you by the Virtual Verbal Behavior Conference. Yes, when the going gets tough, the tough go online. Instead of canceling this year's VBC, Session 112 guest Kelly Rich is putting the entire program online. The Virtual VBC is scheduled for April 2nd and 3rd, but will likely be available afterwards in recorded form. So if you want more information, go to ctacnumeral1.com forward slash podcast. That's ctac1.com forward slash podcast. Hope you check it out. All right, last but certainly not least, I've been getting tons of great feedback on Steve Ward's appearance on the show. If you like his style, the Applied Behavior Analysis Center is hosting a webinar with Steve on June 16th. The Applied Behavior Analysis Center is also offering a 20% discount on this event as well as other offerings to podcast listeners. If you're interested in checking this out, go to abacnj.com and use the promo code ABACBO20 at checkout. I know that's a little bit of a mouthful, so we'll have the full references again at the show notes, which is again at behavioralobservations.com. So without any further delay, please enjoy this fun and dare we say, educational conversation with Amy Evans. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Amy Evans, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? Pretty good. How are you, Matt? Very well, thanks. Thanks for joining me on such short notice. I think everyone in our field is kind of scrambling in terms of how to deal with this coronavirus uh, and the implications of being at home, of not working, and man, all sorts of stuff. You know, I I think there's so many directions and so many areas of life where this pandemic is affecting everyone. And one of them that I thought of is that so many parents are going to be home with their kids. 
And, you know, one of the things that I think would be appropriate to talk about is, you know, how do we keep our kids' skills sharp in the, this era of uh, uh, social dis- distancing? Hopefully it'll be short-lived, but, you know, honestly, we really have no idea where this is going. Yeah, and, these are some crazy and uncertain times for sure. Yeah, you know, I have three kids myself. I've got a sixth, seventh, and ninth grader. And our district has been doing a little bit of distance learning. I live in northern New England, and so we get a lot of snow days. And so for the last 10 years or so, our district has been doing these things called blizzard bags, which basically is at the beginning of each year, the the teachers create kind of five days of canned lessons. So when there's a snow day, there's a snow cancellation, uh, you don't have to quote unquote miss school as long as the you know, a certain percentage of, of the student body completes the assignments. It counts as a school day. Um, but we've been, we've been doing that for about a decade or so. But this is m- much, much different than that. And although a lot of districts are trying to, you know, kind of turn the page and pivot very quickly into this kind of distance learning, uh, obviously it's going to um, require parents to perhaps be more attentive to these sorts of things. And so I thought I'd bring you on and talk about things that us parents can do to keep our kids' skills sharp. So uh, with yeah, all well, of that said, thanks for coming on and agreeing to chat with me on, again on such short notice. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am super excited to be here. And obviously, I'm also sitting at home, so I'm available. Um, this has been really interesting to watch, and I do feel like I'm. Uh, this is a good time to talk to Matt Sicoria because I actually have things to say about this. Every time I listen to your show, I'm always like, what will I have that someone will want to hear about someday? And I feel like I was built for this one. So I'm really happy to help. Well, uh, to that end, let's talk about where uh, you got into this line of work. You know, I, I, you, know you and I met at uh, the Chartlytics uh, two-day workshop in Las Vegas a couple of years ago. Uh, Rick and Dave were kind enough to have me out there to uh, to check it out. It was it was eye opening for me, certainly. And you know, for folks who've tuned into the show, they know that I've had this kind of pet interest in precision teaching, and I've kind of uh, uh, had had a number of people on o- over the last couple of years to talk about it because I, I do find it very intriguing. And so, let's start with talking to you about where you first learned about this, and kind of at the same time, if you could, because I, I want to. My hope is that not just behavior analysts will will listen to this. I actually want to put this on my YouTube channel as well to make it easily uh, consumable by yeah. others. But my hope is that uh, you know folks will share with other parents and things like that. So for for the uninitiated, why don't you talk? Take a second. Not only tell us about your background, but give us kind of like. What's the uh, what's the elevator pitch, or what's the what's the description or definition of precision teaching in a nutshell? Okay, um, so again, talking about the definition of precision teaching is something I've been obsessed with for the last year. So um, happy to share with you what I've come up with. I've actually spent some time digging into old definitions of precision teaching. So let me just kind of give you my updated one. Um, I may not get it word for word, but I've had to do this a couple times recently. So the way that I describe precision teaching is that it is not an approach to teaching. It's more of a measurement system, and it's this whole system of defining how you're going to measure your behavior, whatever that is, whether that's learning a skill or reducing something, um, defining how you're going to how you're going to measure it measuring behavior with like the strongest measurements you can find really sticking to dimensional measurement and then using this chart called the standard acceleration chart to drive database decision making so if you're doing those things then that's precision teaching okay that's very succinct I, i'm <laughs> i'm sure there's a, a a number of uh, rabbit holes to go down with each Definitely. one of those. What yeah. each one of those, uh, I guess, uh, uh, bullet points, if you will. Um, so, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with the, when would you start becoming uh, a precision teacher? And uh, tell tell us a little bit about your background in this line of work. Yeah, um, I have such a silly story, but I think it's a good one. So, I uh, I actually was at Seattle University. Uh, in my undergrad and ran out of money for private Catholic school, had to move home to Nevada, Reno. And I was super not stoked about it because I had to move in with my parents. <laughs> um, but I know it was terrible. I was so angry about it. But um, 
my parents dragged me to, they're really politically active and they dragged me to a political event. I ended up meeting this person named Tuna Townsend and he's just this cool dude who has been involved in Steve Hayes lab for a long time. Um, I don't know if he just never, he never graduated or something, but he just kind of shows up and hangs out or at least he did when I met him. And he said, what are you studying? I said, psychology. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. And he said, well, what do you know about behavior analysis? And I said, I don't know, something about rats maybe. And he said, come with me. So he actually got me into Steve Hayes lab before I knew anything about behavior analysis or precision teaching. And I just kind of sat in the back quietly and took notes. And uh, Tuna explained some concepts to me after the fact. And uh, I did that once or twice. And then um, Nick Behrens needed a research assistant. And I got into that. And so I would be showing up um, to do some work with Nick on his dissertation, which I, I really hope he publishes at some point. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'd be at the Center for Advanced Learning, which is now Fit Learning. Um, and I was sitting there and I would see co kids coming in and out and lots of friendly faces, but I had no idea what they were doing. And one day they were like, do you want to see what we do here? And <laughs> I said, sure, this looks cool. So I sat in on a couple sessions and then they said, do you want to work here? And I said, um, yeah, I like kids. This seems great. Why not? So um, totally fell into this out of an, a complete accident, I think. And then I just got really into it. So I was a, a learning coach at Fit Learning early on in Nevada and um, got really excited about that and then started taking graduate level courses at UNR. And then I decided I really loved precision teaching. So I went to move to Pennsylvania to work with Rick Kubina at Penn State. Um, and the rest is history because that's kind of, uh, ever since then, I've been a precision teacher. I've always had kind of my own tutoring thing going on um, as a side gig most of the time. And then uh, I've kind of moved around working with people that I thought did interesting work. I got to go to Hong Kong and work under Elizabeth Cotton for a little bit. And then um, I moved to Boston after that and worked with uh, Richard McManus at the Fluency Factory. And then I've just kind of been uh, working with Chartlytics ever since. I see. And uh, for those who may be encountering this work again, going back to the idea that hopefully listeners will share this to, you know, non-behavior analytic uh, listeners or viewers, uh, tell us a little bit about what fit learning does and more generally what, what the approach would be in, in these types of tutoring situations using precision teaching. Sure. So these learning centers that do amazing work, fit learning is one of them. Um, essentially what they do is they take the curriculum and the skills that are absolutely necessary to do well in school. So it's really focusing on reading and math and some core language comprehension, writing components. And they kind of break those down into what we call pinpoints, these really specific um, sets of skills and figure out exactly which ones are missing from a learner's repertoire, which ones need strengthening. And so what you know, decades of doing this has, has shown is that if we get kids really super fluent with certain skills, um, then it's enough to kind of fill up that foundation and have them learn new content quicker, uh, engage in school with a little more rigor, um, and usually kind of dealing with learners with learning disabilities or something like that. These kids end up feeling more confident and more interested in school because they've had this um, experience with success in learning. Okay. So, so you mentioned the F word, fluency. Yes. <laughs> Let's um, talk about that. Uh, I want to come back to that in just a second. But yeah. uh, when you say breaking skills down, uh, mm -hmm. so it's not like, uh, so addition is not sufficiently uh, pinpointed, if you will, or it's not sufficiently detailed uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, right? So what would, what would, yeah. what would be some things that like, you know, let's say someone was learning basic, uh, addition facts. What are the things, what are, what are some of the, how, how would you break that down into more discrete components? Just to, as an example. There's so much to being good at basic math. 
And so one thing that happens in schools and just sort of in the general education process is kids may not get masterful with some of those skills as they're going through their school years. And then it starts to get harder and harder and just sort of compound over time. So just basic things like um, I work with a lot of kids that are getting into algebra and they're just hitting that point where you have to combine all these skills, right? But going backwards, I have to make sure that they can write numbers, read and write numbers um, at a high enough rate that it doesn't slow them down and get in their way when they have to do these more complex skills. So that's the first thing I look at. Can they even read and write numbers confidently and quickly? Um, and you'd be surprised how many kids at the high school level are still behind on that on those skills. So oh, that's oh. something to clean up. <laughs> I, I, I believe it. You know, I, um, we had some company uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, some folks were visiting from Florida, and one of the people who was staying with us, uh, she was a math teacher at like one of the most, one of the highest end private schools in in, in the state of Florida. Okay. I mean, schools that like cost more than college, you know, um, and, and she te- she's like the chair of the math department. She teaches AP, this, that, and the other thing, all aspects related to math. Um, and I said, do you have kids who don't know their basic math facts like quickly and have to like use calculators and multiplication charts? She's like, oh yeah. And I'm like, are oh, you yeah. kidding me? And uh, she said, absolutely. So these things, I think for some of us who... You know, I, I, what, what I want to kind of avoid is the kind of back in my day stuff because uh, I, I do plenty <laughs> of that as it is, uh, you know, um, as someone well into their 40s. But uh, I will use that here in this case. I think a lot of the, you know, uh, kind of old school kind of uh, repetition and things like that uh, for, you know, and I don't know if that fell out of favor. And I don't, you know, uh, I, I think I'll leave it to others to kind of maybe plot that educational history. Of, of, of differing perspectives on how things like this were taught. But uh, yeah, it, it seems less common these days. And again, I, I, I really feel like I'm like this close to saying I walked up hill both ways in the snow <laughs> to school barefoot. But uh, yeah, anyway, well, so I yeah, I guess long story short is that, you know, these things are incre- seem to be increasingly common just based on my anecdotal observations and just chatting with other people who are in these areas where they see these things firsthand. Yeah, I think it's really true. I think there are conflicting theories about learning and education that come into kind of come in waves in our education system. And so kids are, kids these days are, um, you know, just kind of guinea pigs in that process. And uh, the best thing we can do for our society, for our children right now, is to really look to where the research says what, what works. And there's a lot that we already know about what works. And um, there's a lot of great curriculum out there. There's a lot of amazing materials. And there's a lot to be said for this concept of building these basic skills up to high levels of competency or proficiency, and then seeing how we can expand from there. Um, I think a lot of people get that. um, They may get that concept. Um, but applying it can be hard in the classroom because there's all these other things. You have to move through the way our system is set up. You've got to keep going um, through the curriculum, whether kids are ready for it or not. So uh, I don't blame the system. I don't, definitely don't blame teachers or parents. I think it's a complicated, very complex thing that we've been dealing with with our, with our children for years. I'm someone who grew up in California, um, in the age of whole read, whole language reading. So I was one of those test kids and I learned how to read magically <laughs> um, for other reasons. Through exposure but, to the material, right? Yes, exactly. So there's, there's another thing that's, um, I don't know the exact statistic, but I've always found this really interesting. And I think this is something that I heard from Kent Johnson at some point. Um, something along the lines of 60, maybe 60% of kids will learn in the absence of any meaningful instruction. Like some kids just get exposure and still figure it out. Yeah. And that makes it look like our teaching is effective when really we need to be focusing on what works for all kids or, you know, that other 40 or 30%, whatever it is. 
So I might be messing up that statistic, but I think it's a really interesting way of looking at what we're doing. Yeah, I think another way of looking at it too, and let's let's just for, for sake of argument, just assume that that's true. And even if the ratio is off, let's say it's 40 to 60, let's say it's reversed or um, think of how much more skilled that those learners who kind of quote unquote get it would be if exposed to some of these more efficient teaching methods. Oh yeah. You know? So uh, I think I've, about uh, that sometimes. I've had the opportunity to, um, to work with some really gifted learners and seeing what they can do when you bolster those skills is really amazing. I have to imagine. Yeah. Uh, another thing while we're kind of making the case for uh, these developing these kind of earlier skills, these prerequisite skills, perhaps, is that, you know, as someone who consults to schools, working with kids with severe behavior problems, I oftentimes, I, I, over the last couple of years, I've been actually, even more recently than that, I've been asking questions about not just what do they know, but in terms of how, you know, the, the, how, how fluent they are, how comfortable they are with things like math facts, letter sounds and things like that. I used to kind of just defer, okay, this is out of my scope of expertise. So, you know, uh, just make sure that they're not given work that's too hard, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, we don't want to create motivation for them to escape that, those tasks because it's too difficult. Uh, but I've since kind of uh, um, tried to get my uh, uh, my foot in the door a little bit with some of those things by by saying, okay, well, not you know, because a lot of people would say, oh yeah, yeah, they 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 know fill in the blank skill, right? That one kills me. And uh, they may be accurate. Uh, you know, there was one kiddo I was uh, asked to do a behavioral assessment on, um, and what I did is I printed out a piece of uh, paper that had a bunch of math facts on them. I said, well, you know, let's give it a go. I'm going to time you. It's no big deal. You know, just, I just want to see, just go as quickly as possible. Don't worry about making mistakes. Uh, And he was 100% accurate with these math facts, but he was counting on his fingers. Uh He's a fifth grader. Uh, And these are things that, you know, should have been fluent, you know, two and three, maybe four years prior to that. And, And then we're wondering why he's melting down when they're trying to teach long division. When you have to add, subtract, yeah. multiply, divide, you know, blah, 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 oh, yeah. you know, and, and uh, so again, I, I, you know, not to belabor the point, but I think the case for not just being accurate, but, but quick uh, is certainly, um, certainly important. So again, bringing it back to our topic, you know, whatever parents can do to help practice those skills, I think would be really helpful information. And before we get to that, I want to come back to this this concept of fluency we've, we're kind of talking in, around right now. And, and um, is there, you know, I always thought just the fluency is the combination of accuracy and speed. Is there a different way or am I missing something or, or what, what, how would you describe uh, the, this, this concept we call fluency? Today, I'm going to share with you how to develop a more effective website for your ABA practice in one minute. My name is Rich Brooks and I've been developing websites for therapists and businesses for over 20 years. It all starts by focusing on the needs of your ideal client or referrer. Your website isn't about your practice. It's about the people you serve. People enter your site only thinking about themselves. So if you start off your homepage talking about how experienced you are, how long you've been in practice, and all the awards you've won, they're going to get turned off and leave. But if you immediately address their needs, their concerns, and their pain points, they may just stick around to learn more. Use language that's friendly and helpful, not jargony. Write like you speak to concerned parents or caring refers. Lead your guests with helpful next steps at the bottom of each page and ultimately to a contact form so that you can turn this into a conversation. I couldn't include everything I wanted to share in just one minute, so for more advice on creating a more effective website, visit takeflight.com slash ABA Minute. Yeah, so there's a couple things. First of all, that accuracy plus speed um definition is one that I used for a long time and that a lot of people can kind of conjure up when you say, what does fluency mean? Um, And I think one of my favorite definitions that I've found recently is from Johnson and Street in 2004. They say performance that's flowing, flexible, effortless, automatic, confident, second nature, and masterful. And I think that's really important um, a good way of looking at fluency because it really helps us understand that it's not about, it's not really about speed. It's about a certain 
frequency or a certain speed. So it's not about fast. It's about a certain speed and a certain level of accuracy at which these things kind of come together. So there's sort of a natural um, frequency or rate of response that feels that way for different skills, um, where you feel confident doing it. It's automatic. It's effortless. Those are the things to look for. Um, so we kind of know it when we see it with fluent responding, you know, when there isn't this weird look of hesitation or frustration. Um, and, and there's usually sort of a, a feel to it. But the other really important thing that I try to remind people about fluency is that it's not so much, we, we have a tendency to measure fluency by looking at accuracy and speed, because that's what we can look at in the moment and say, is it fast and is it accurate? But what the whole point of that is to get it fast enough and accurate enough that it produces those outcomes. And so ways that we've measured those outcomes are looking at whether it retains, whether that skill is still there after some period of no practice, um, whether there's endurance with it. Can that person do that skill for a certain amount of time? That's sort of a natural amount of time, of course, um, without fatiguing. And then is it stable? Can there be distractions in the room and it, the skill is still strong and they're, they're able to persist? You know, kids that are doing something that they're good at will not necessarily get distracted when something's happening behind them. But when they're doing something that they're terrible at, then they will take the first opportunity to, to in, uh, invite that distraction. Um, so retention, endurance, stability. And then the big one for me that I, I really want to remind people to look at is that application part. Are they taking that skill and then using it? Um, so, so we talk about generalization, looking at things across settings or across stimuli. Application is kind of like taking it to the next level, being able to apply, you know, reading and writing numbers to uh, basic computation or being able to apply basic computation to fractions um, and, and long division. So it's that kind of looking at that next level skill that I find the most valuable in assessing whether you really got that, that prerequisite skill or that component skill fluent. I see. You know, there's, I, as you were kind of going through that, I had so many questions come to mind. Uh, I, I think the concept of retention is, is a really important here, especially since, you know, throughout most of the country, uh, most of our kids are going to be on this kind of extended hiatus from the typical learning environment. So at least with my little ones, um, I, you know, I, the retention is something I, 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 I'm definitely concerned with. Uh, and so um, the fact that learning stuff in the way that you've described aids and retention, uh, I think is, is in, incredibly helpful at this particular point in time with these challenges that we're being presented with worldwide. Um, well, I, I, as an example, you know, I was talking to a group of uh, paraprofessionals in a school district the other day, and uh, I, I made the the comparison or the I, the distinction rather between, you know, learning high school Spanish versus riding a bike. You know, one is fluent and retained uh, versus one that may have been acquired, and you may have been accurate with your Spanish conjugations or what have you. But a couple of years out of out of high school, and it kind of goes by the wayside. And one of the things I, I kind of speculated about is that you know riding a bike is if you think of all the repetitions that you make, literally the rep, you know, in terms of uh, uh, revolutions per minute, the cadence, you know, that the, there's so many reps that you're 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 uh, that you're making with each pedal stroke, it's just gr you know grinding that that repertoire into your you know uh, you know grind, grinding that skill into your repertoire um, and that it's very very durable uh, and it, it kind of meets all those requirements you just talked about in terms of your prone to distraction yada 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 and certainly the 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 stakes are pretty high as well you know in terms of maintaining an, an upright position and not falling or crashing or what have you so oh yeah. Uh, That's a perfect example. I mean, I'm always looking for good examples to talk about fluency and, and retention. So that's a really good one. I'll keep yeah, that one. Yeah, feel mind. free to steal it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm a bike nut. So I was looking for analogies. Uh, you know, another, another one that, that came to mind too, as I was talking, is anything sports related or anything uh, music related, you know, repetition and, and, and speed. You know, I, I'm, um, 
w- one of the things I'm trying to do during this kind of hiatus, if you were this irregular work pattern or what ha- whatever the hell you want to call it, is I have dabbled playing playing the guitar as an instrument for you know since I was a kid, uh, but I never learned to read music. Uh, and so I have this app on my phone that you and it, the real, the neat thing is it, it, it's it's programmed to for fluent responding because you have to not only you know it, it flashes up a note and you have to there's a select there's a, a number of selections it's a multiple choice that you have to do you have to uh, tap uh, and not only do you have to be accurate but you have to get it under a certain time in order to progress to the next level and it's kind of gamified almost like you know the old Angry Birds apps were and stuff like that. And then, so it's kind of, it's kind of neat to see other people kind of discover these things and, and use them and whatnot. And so I'm hoping if I can uh, stick to it, I'll, I'll have some fluent note reading at a certain point, but oh, you yeah. know, I think those types of analogies are helpful. You know, I always want to make a, a uh, almost like a, like a parody video, you know, kind of like, what if, what if we taught math? What, what if we, uh, what, what if we taught uh, martial arts, like we taught math? Oh you know, God, and you have someone doing like single student responding, someone like the sensei just standing and talking to a group of people sitting down and asking like questions with people answering in one, you know, one hand at a time, you know, oh <laughs> could you? That would be awful. It would be hilarious, but it would be really terrible and scary to watch. Right, right. I mean, or what if, what if we taught, what if we taught music that way? What if we taught all these things that, that, that require, you know, kind of active frequent student responding and, you know, within a, a, a time bound uh, circumstance, you know. So yeah, I, I mean, we get it in so many other aspects of the world: um, music, sports. It's it's uh, just an assumption that, of course, we're going to start with the basics. Of course, you have to do your scales. You have to, um, you know, wax on and wax off. Um, but we don't we don't always do that in a meaningful way for our little learners, and then it catches up with them in the later years, which is why people like me stay employed with tutoring, you know, third grade and beyond when things start to really get harder. Um, I think it's, I think it's really interesting to, uh, to remind people that the rest of the world gets this. It's just an education where we're forgetting that this is how people learn. Yeah. And, and, and not to take us off into a, a, a rant or of, <laughs> and whatnot. Um, and I'll, I'll try to steer us out of the ditch if we end up going in that direction. But, and I'm really just saying this to remind myself not to do that. But anyway, <laughs> you know, I, there are some teachers I work with and they'll say, I want to do some of this kind of drill-based work. And uh, our curriculum coordinator, our principal, or, you know, fill in the blank authority is forbidding us to do that, you know? And so there's some, there's some barriers in the way of teachers that make it really really challenging. You mentioned third grade and up. What I've heard this and I'm so glad we're having this conversation because so many questions are popping up just based because I get I get fed <laughs> all these lines all the time. I don't mean that pejoratively, but you know, the, there's so much uh, mythology and lore and f- more, more so folklore in 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 the education world and so I want to ask you this question. I I I've heard that phrase well at first they're learning to read and now they're reading to learn uh and that's where pro- that's where the rubber hits the road is that is that you know it, it's a it's a cliche i've heard you know but is that cliche true from your perspective or is there a better way to kind of think through that problem or that 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 phenomenon um i don't know if there's a better way that is exactly what i'm referring to here um the first couple of years it's okay for kids to be learning the mechanics of reading And it's usually around third grade that text gets a little bit longer and then kids are supposed to be reading aloud and the the work on teaching mechanics of reading um, falls outside of the purview of the the classroom for typical third graders. Um, So oftentimes if you haven't figured it out by then, then all of a sudden it's up to you to... Uh, be able to read entire paragraphs or passages and then read to comprehend. And then it's really focusing on those comprehension tasks, which if you don't have the mechanics down, how are you supposed to comfortably um, and accurately understand what you're reading? So um, that is exactly what I'm referring to. And it's particularly with reading, but it's also kind of when things happen in math. Um, if you don't, if you didn't really catch on to basic, um, basic concepts, basic number sense, then when you start to have to do these uh, ad- more advanced computational tasks, 
that's when it's, it's still around the same time that that starts to get harder and, and it starts to be clearer which kids are stuck and which kids are ready for that. Okay. All right, cool. So that's a myth that is that is not busted. All right. Very good. All right. So we've been uh, again just kind of plotting through the case here for 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 this type of um focus. Let's talk about what parents uh, again can can do. Um you know, I I think it's unlikely unless someone has access to you know, I don't want to get too much into the standard acceleration chart because I'm I'm guessing that many listeners and viewers won't have access to one. So um, uh, we can maybe talk about that towards the end uh, and, and circle back to that for those, you know, kind of super eager beavers who want to, you know, uh, d- dive into that. Um, what I'd rather focus on is what people can do with the resources that they have available to them, either maybe even within their house or maybe stuff that's available online. Uh, and then what, folks can do with those materials in terms of how to practice and things like that. I'm wondering if the latter might be a better place to start in terms of, okay, how do you, how do you want to practice and what would be some examples? Yeah. I think if we kind of set the stage for what this could look like, and then we can talk about materials because I'm, I've got, I'm kind of like a curriculum hoarder and uh, (laughs) I've learned a lot over the years, especially kind of working with kids of all ages. I've learned a lot about what's cool and and useful, um, both digital and printable. So I've compiled a whole list for you of things and we can go through some of those in more depth. Um, But I think setting the stage for, let's say you have, you know, in a perfect world, you have plenty of time, you have a whole setup, a classroom set up in your home. I mean, these are kinds of things that you're going to have to improvise. Um, Most of us do not have those kinds of luxuries. So I do want to acknowledge that whatever we're saying from here on out and these suggestions we're making are definitely for, um, you know, I, I don't want anyone to feel bad if you don't, if you can't set the stage. Um, you may have to be kind to yourself and let your kid hang out on the iPad for a little bit while you get some work done or manage other, other parts of your, your life at home these days. So I want to make sure to acknowledge that before we move on. But assuming you can set up a classroom in your home and you're really motivated to do this and you have the resources to do so, I think it would be a really cool way to, there's lots of things that teachers may be sending you and I say go forward and do those things and kind of stick with the curriculum, that'll be useful. But one of the coolest things about having some time to just work with your learner, your student, your child as a student is that you can kind of figure out what they need and build some really basic skills that will make it easier for them to go back into the classroom when that time comes um, and feel a little bit more comfortable or positive about things that they may have been struggling with in the past. So I think that that'll be really cool and that's what we should probably talk about here. So um, yeah, so, so in order to build fluent skills, there's a couple things. First, I like I like to think about it as you want to find those prerequisite or component basic tool skills that are foundational to whatever might be a struggle or, um, or seem scary to your, <laughs> to your kid right now. And so you may want to follow what they're asking for, what you're seeing in their homework or what their teachers have told you about where they're stuck. Um, you may want to kind of find one or two areas to really focus on. And, and this is an opportunity to focus in on a couple specific skills that could really help. Um, so the, we talked about how not being able to read and write numbers can totally slow down progress in math. Um, if you've got an older kid and they're struggling with algebra, um, then make sure they learn their fractions. Just go all in on fractions. If they're struggling with long division, it's usually some combination of, you know, multiplication, uh, division, uh, addition, and subtraction facts, and they may need to just get a little bit stronger with those. So um, usually look at where they're struggling and then kind of break it down into all the things involved and being able to do that comfortably. And you can kind of find those areas to work on. But I say pick one or two. And then what we would do is set up what we call frequency building, um, also referred to as fluency-based instruction. 
So you can get really simple materials for this. They're essentially working on the same thing for a period of time. So it can be just different versions of the same worksheet. Um, and I know it sounds boring, but it's actually really fun if you set it up right. So make sure that it, this is a fun, exciting environment, um, that there's a lot of you know, interest in making this a, a good time. Because if you just, if you say we're going to do drills, um, kids don't always get super excited about that. That's a tough sell, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't fall into the drill and kill um, world. But this isn't drill and kill. This is focused practice on important critical skills. So what I would recommend for frequency building, the way this is set up is you have some sort of material or some sort of setup where they can kind of work on the same skill, whether it's addition facts, and maybe you want to break that down into a smaller set of facts so they can get those really strong and then build on that and do another set of facts. Um, so maybe they're doing a whole sheet of that. Maybe there's like 50 or 100 on the page, whatever. I've got a few materials for you, whatever you can find, lots of opportunities to just keep going at their own pace, what we call free operant responding. Um, they should be able to just sort of set their own pace and you can time them and see how far they get in a certain amount of time. Then what you do is you practice that same thing a few times, give feedback in between, kind of work with them on if there's anything that they need to be taught more closely or um, that they need to do extra practice on, spend some time with them, just kind of uh, uh, with a whiteboard or something like drilling those couple of facts that they were struggling with in their timings. And then go back and do another one, another timed practice where you can see if they beat their last score, whether they get more correct, more accurate or faster. Um, and then usually you can sort of see that grow over time. Everything takes practice. Nobody is fluent on their first try. So all of these might take a couple of days or a couple of weeks to really master. But frequency building is that process of doing a timed practice, giving some sort of feedback, doing some extra coaching, whatever it takes, doing another timed practice. And so if you have multiple kids or you have like one kid that kind of helps a younger student, you can even set them up to help each other and uh, make it kind of a, an engaged activity where they get to decide what do we need to do based on how we just performed. Should we practice again? Should we get help and spend some extra time on wherever we got stuck? Um, so getting the kids involved in, in that decision-making process about what to do based on how they performed is a really cool way to also get everybody involved and kind of make it more interesting, more um, student-centered, if you will. All right, cool. So let me just make sure I have all the steps correctly. So first of all, we have to obtain some materials. And mm -hmm. um, you sent me a, a, a list of several bullet points uh, where we can get some materials, and I'll include those in, in the show notes of this episode. Uh, so that's step one. Step two would be to see how long they would take to complete, let's say it's just a sheet of math facts. You just use math facts because it's something easy that everyone can kind of visualize. Yeah. And um, what, what, what length of time would you have them start with? I, I, you know, I think that we have this notion of the, the, the so-called mad minute, if you will. Uh -huh. um, and I've heard uh, different pieces of advice from different precision teachers about, you know, a minute might be too long for some, um, you know, you can get good information about where a learner is, uh, where their skills are with, with shorter times. Mm -hmm. um, how would you help kind of a, 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 a newbie uh, with, to this make the determination of what would be a, a sufficient amount of time? Yeah, that's a really amazing question. And uh, what's cool about my experience with this is that I've worked with so many of those different precision teachers that have different approaches to it, that I can just sort of, I'm not attached to any one of them, and I can just throw out a few ideas. So the first and most important thing is there's a few considerations around your materials themselves. And if you can't control the materials, I'm not expecting anybody to sit at home and like design their own instruction at this point. Um, let's say you find a worksheet that has 50 problems on a page, then you need to figure out about how much time does it take you or, you know, someone who's competent with this skill, how long does it take them to do that? 
to finish the whole page and just make sure that you have enough time on, on the timing that you do that they don't finish and then run out of things to do because that'll kind of mess up the whole thing. Um, so sometimes you can set it based on, I want you to try to finish the page and let's see how long it takes. But I find it easier to do, uh, I'm going to set the timer for this amount of time and see how far you get. Um, and if you get to the point that you can finish the page, then good on you. Um, so that's the first thing is just based on your materials. I've found some worksheets online that only have 20 problems and that's the, the most you can get. Um, so you need to have enough enough materials that they won't run out of stimuli, essentially, especially if it's like a writing task. Um, if it's a reading task or something, they can always come back up to the top, but that's a little weird and you want to celebrate them finishing. So um, a few things to think about there. When it comes to stories, I like to, some kids like to finish the whole story. Um, so sometimes I just let them and we just see how long that takes if that's what they're into. So those are things to think about too. Like, will it feel good to finish the whole thing? Um, and that's the whole keeping it fun part of it, right? Keep it, it fun, yeah. <laughs> if this kid really burns out after a minute of reading a passage, then don't have them read a passage for five minutes. So those are some things to think about. But also when, when you're trying to kind of see what a kid's capable of versus what they actually do, um, when they have to do it in real life, you kind of see how long, how long are kids required to, you know, how long does it take to read a paragraph or a, or a story or do these math facts? Um, if you're supposed to get X number per minute, then can my, can my kid do that? If, if I just give them the top row, can they do that at the, the rate that we want them to? And then maybe they're just kind of running out of steam trying to do it for a minute. So some people, um, some people do a short timing at the beginning and just say, okay, do a sprint and let's just see what you can do uh, with just the top row. And that just sort of gets them kind of warmed up, helps them feel what it's like to go nice and fast without them really contacting that, um, that fatigue. But then also do a long timing to just see if they can kind of push their, um, their, their speed and, and maintain that for a little bit longer. So kind of the short timing, long timing is one option. Another option is kind of pick, um, oh gosh, there's so much to say here, so I'll try to keep it short. But try to pick something that's, uh, that, that is right before they start to hit fatigue. So let's say, you know, try it at a minute and see what happens. And watch that minute and see where in that minute did they start to really slow down or give up or whatever it is the first time you try it. And then be like, I would never do another minute with them until they're ready. So then you might cut it down to that 15 seconds or 30 seconds. Um, it's, always a, it's always better to do a shorter timing than to do a timing that's too long. So if you're not sure where to start, uh, just start short and work your way up. And that's totally fine. Once, they, once they're kind of rocking at 15 seconds, move them to 20 seconds or 30 seconds. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. and um, the only thing I would say is I wouldn't ever require somebody to do a task that there's no like physical capability or no real world example where they would have to do it for that long. That's just torture for most kids. Um, sure. And if it's something that they're not good at, which is essentially you're probably going to be picking something that these kids are not great at. Um, then it may not be fun to do it for very long. So let them kind of contact getting a little bit better with shorter and shorter with a shorter amount of time and then kind of build that up. As I mentioned at the top of the show, if you like Steve's point of view on things, he will be doing a webinar hosted by the Applied Behavior Analysis Center on teaching functional independence. During this webinar, Steve will discuss an analysis of how the timing of prompts impacts the development of independence. He will also describe what it takes to make a functional behavior truly functional meaning doing so after it's been asked of, doing it without reminders, not taking a light year to complete the routine, etc. Steve will explain how functional independence can be targeted from the very beginning of a learner's programming and into vocational and inclusive education opportunities. Participants will be provided with an assessment and guided to score their students' perseverance and focus and select potential instructional targets. 
The team at ABAC is offering listeners a 20% discount on this webinar, as well as many of their other offerings. Just go to abacnj.com forward slash products forward slash teaching functional independence and use the promo code ABACBO20. I know that discount code is a whole eight characters in length, so just go to the show notes of this episode. I'll have the links waiting there for you. All right. So because I know people like concrete guidance, uh, would it be fair to say that starting in the 15 to 30 second range would be uh, appropriate? Can I I know there's a million different considerations based Mm -hmm. on all the different ramifications that you just talked about, but would that be, uh, you know, just for someone who might be hesitant to try this because of all the different um, things that you just mentioned, Mm -hmm. uh, would that, would that be kind of like a default range? So I'm going to say for the purpose of our conversation today and the people that might li- be listening today, let's go with it. I yeah, say because, 10 yeah, to 15 seconds, you're fine. Yeah, um, yeah keeping then, in mind that, that this is not, we're not building a, 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 uh, a long-term precision teaching intervention where we're trying right. to help just maintain some skills and perhaps build, uh, you know, uh, improve some skills, uh, you know, while in, in the midst of coping with all this other stuff going on in our lives. That's right. Yeah. All right. Excellent. So sorry to put you on the uh, on, uh, on the hot <laughs> seat totally there. On but, the, um, the answer is always that it depends on the learner. So that's the other thing that I'll just say about that is let your kid tell you. They can say like, hey, I want to do, just ask them, how long do you want to try today? And see what they can do. Um, it's really amazing when you involve kids in that process, um, what, they, what they're willing to try. Um, when they get to kind of control it a little bit more. So don't be afraid to ask them what they want to do. And if they say, I want to do five seconds, then why not do five seconds? It's better to do multiple short timings, um, at least at this phase. It's better to do multiple short timings than to do like one boring long timing and then like not have them enjoy it and not have them have that feedback in between and kind of contact multiple opportunities to contact success. Yeah. So if they're going to be, if they struggle with their math facts, again, just sticking with that as an example, and you're having them do that for a full 60 seconds and it's, it just becomes a, a real negative experience and you're going to be dragging them to the table. It's going to be coercive. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so um, good advice there. Um, so what uh, I know in the world of precision teaching, there's this whole concept of, of, of aims. Um mm-hmm. Let's talk about that for a second. First of all, what what is an aim? Uh, and uh, I guess more generally, how should we know where our learners should be, where our kids should be with a particular skill? So let's say we've identified a, a, a very specific component of a, of a larger skill um, that, that we want to work on. And... To that end, what what uh, how do we know what a good uh, you know? And again, I, so one of the things I, I I'm assuming what we're doing throughout this process is measuring the number correct and the number incorrect within these given timings. Those are kind of like what our benchmarks are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so how do we know what's good? I guess that's a really good question. So um, this is something that I've spent a lot of time on too, and I actually wrote a blog about it. Like two or three years ago. Um, So I did share that link with you that kind of goes through what an aim is and um, some different ways to to get aims or to get access to them or to figure out what an aim might be. So when when we're talking about aims here, we're talking about um, performance standards. So a certain rate, assuming assuming decent accuracy um, and Typically, I would go for 100% accuracy. Uh, I don't have a rule about that. I focus more on that, um, on this rate. But assuming accuracy, then the point is, what is the rate of response for this skill? And it's usually in a per minute um, rate, but you can kind of convert that for what would it, what would it have to be in 30 seconds or two minutes or whatever. So what is that rate? that is most likely to produce those outcomes of fluency that we talked about. So retention, endurance, stability, application. What are the rates at which if a learner can do it at this rate, 
and they can do it at that rate consistently, then they're, they're able to get those outcomes. So there's a few, there's a few out there that have been well-researched and that have been tried out with different types of learners and have actually been measured to, to produce those outcomes. Um, and so those are the ones I would turn to first. So I also shared a couple of links with you. Um, so there's, there's an article. I mean, I think th these have been around and precision teachers have been kind of looking into these for a long time. So the first one I know of is Clay Starlin in 1971 wrote something about this in reading. Um, and since then, we've had a ton of research in reading on critical skills for how many, you know, how many letter sounds per minute does a kid need to read in first grade in order to be able to read fluently um, later in life. Same thing, I think we have another one from uh, Houghton in 1972 about Eames, and that's kind of how they started to come up with some of these um, and some new ones that had been established by then. But in the precision teaching book, Rick Kubina has a whole appendix of common pinpoints in the precision teaching literature and the aims for those. And that goes across reading and math and handwriting. Um, and then another really important one for those of you who work with learners on the autism spectrum, um, Fabrizio Moores has one in 2003. So, so and they, what they did that's really cool that I, I've found really super useful is they broke out the skill, the aims, based on learning channels. So we haven't talked about learning channels, but it's essentially like the modality in which these skills are conducted or, or done. So whether it's a, something that you're, we were talking earlier about like writing on a worksheet, you're seeing that and, and writing. So that would be a C-write learning channel. Um, a lot of reading would be a C-say. There might be hearsays where um, I'm saying something as a teacher and you're supposed to hear that and then respond um, orally, then that's a hearsay. So those are different learning channels. There's a lot, a lot to say about that, but um, Fabrizio and Moores broke it up by learning channel and said, here are some, some basic aim ranges based on learning channel that have produced these outcomes for learners with autism specifically. So um, that's a really good resource. So there's a ton out there. There's a lot that won't be. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a lot that you might have to make up. Like I, I've worked with kids where we were teaching um, reading clocks and calculating uh, time elapsed. So, you know, they'd have two different times and then they had to also say how, you know, how much time has passed between this clock and this clock. Okay. So, so a, lot of, a lot of skills being applied simultaneously there. Yeah, so we broke that down and did a couple, and this was all just working with a third grader. I would see her homework one day and then find some worksheets online, and then we'd do timings until she got it, and then we would see if she did okay in school. Um, anyway, just from that example, I had to just sort of make it up based on what I thought a third grader should be able to do in order to like do this comfortably, and I kind of watched her a little bit to see where she was at. And I also timed myself doing it. Obviously I'm much quicker at writing and thinking through these things and I have a lot more practice, but I, my goal was to get her as good at it as I am. And we got her pretty close and that was good enough for her to do well in school. So we kind of stopped there. So for a parent who would say they download some of these materials and these really helpful links that you've shared, or uh, or maybe they have materials, uh, you know, that, uh, hanging around the house or something like that. Um, perhaps the st most straightforward way to 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 figure out that is to, uh, at least based on what I'm hearing from you, is to kind of just try it themselves with some timings and you know, kind of see what uh, what um, uh, how they would do, and then uh, uh, use that as kind of uh, something in the ballpark to to shoot for. Yes. Yes, and aims really are a ballpark because they're, first of all, they're always expressed as a range. So it's like, you know, 80 to 100 per minute or, um, or you know, something along those lines. And sometimes it's switched where it's 100 to 80 per minute because the whole goal is to shoot for the stars, try to get them to that highest range. But see if, if you get them to 85 per minute, are they getting those outcomes? So are they retaining it? Are they um, able to apply it? So even kind of finding creative ways to work on something and kind of 
test your theories, your hypothesis about what's appropriate for them. Um, work on a basic skill and then kind of test a more component composite skill, like a big, a bigger, tougher thing where they have to use that. Um, so if you're working on one of those worksheet sites where there's just like a bunch of different levels, then just pull one of the harder levels and see if they can apply it, um, what they've been working on. And if they can, then you, then they're good enough. They're good enough to go. You know, I'm reminded of a slide. I, um, I saw a presentation by uh, Dr. Kim Barron's from the aforementioned Fit Learning, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, she shared some data from a learner that uh, uh, what they did is they did weekly probes of reading nonsense words, but every day they they were doing their you know um, letter sounds and it, they went through their whole like reading scope and sequence. Uh, and, but, but once a week they would probe on, again, reading nonsense words, which perhaps would be, represent the, the terminal skill. Mm-hmm. And, um, as the, as the learner made progress with some of these more basic elements or building blocks of reading their, their performance on those weekly probes of nonsense reading, uh, word reading, uh, went higher as a result of that. So it sounds like they're, that kind of might've been an example of what you're, what you're describing here. One of the things I was thinking about is that, you know, again, just using math, cause it's, um, I think fairly straightforward to kind of c- conceptualize here. If you have a child who's struggling with their math facts, let's say they're, and then you test a long division problem or something like that. If you see them getting better at their long division over time as a function of becoming more fluent with their basic math facts, that would be one way to perhaps check that application uh, outcome. Am I making some correct connections here? Yep. You're on the right track here. So that's exactly what I mean. Um, That application check uh, I've found to be the most meaningful thing when it comes to measuring these outcomes. Um, We're kind of Today, our conversation is kind of skirting around this topic of measurement, which is uh, really central to what makes these um, these processes long term successful. Uh, so that measurement system, that precision teaching measurement system that we've been talking about, but not totally get diving into, um, that's really what makes the work that Fit Learning does and the work that I've done. Um, that's really what makes it work is that, you know, always measuring for outcomes, measuring progress and seeing if you can um, increase how quickly kids are learning. Um, So the standard acceleration chart is a really amazing tool for that. But I also want to acknowledge that you can, you can do frequency building and you can build skills, but, it, as long as you're just kind of taking this, um, take kind of a, a scientist's approach to it, though. You're kind of testing your hypothesis. If I get this kid this fast at this skill or this strong with this skill, let's, let's not even say fast. Um, you know, if I build this, the strength of this one skill, can I, is that useful to them in their world? So finding ways to kind of have those real world checks. And that may be, you know, you may be sitting home at, with your kid and they've got their homework worksheets or their at home assignments or whatever, that may be your application check. Just all these little things that we're working on in the background. Am I seeing that translate into their real world? And it may not, it may be too much of a gap to see that translation. So that's why, again, why precision teachers have so many of these skills locked and loaded that we're ready to work on. Because we know that once you get, you have to get enough of those really strong before you start to see those bigger outcomes. But um, just kind of playing with it, I think, is a good idea. Uh, don't get stuck on a specific number because that number is based on based on a group of kids at some point um, that when they got that that fast, they were able to produce these outcomes. But for your kid, you can you get to watch them and see when you know at what point do they look fluent? At what point do they look comfortable with it? At what point can they really use that skill and you think they're not going to forget it this time? So you could either you, you could even wait a couple of days, don't touch it, and then be like, hey, do you can you still do this thing that we were doing a few days ago? And if they can, then you've done your job. So that's another another way to just sort of 
I won't give you the entire measurement system, but I do think that um, just kind of taking that approach of being a scientist and being curious about how these things are all connected will really serve you. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And, you know, I, you know, I think we're both very much tempted to launch into the <laughs> rationale for using the standard acceleration chart, but I think it's perhaps beyond the scope uh, at, at this stage. Um, and maybe that's something we can circle back to at a, at a different point in time sure. um, for those who are, you know, really bought into this. But I'm, again, I'm just trying to think of the the average listener home with their kids trying to, you know, um, with with enough stuff on their plate, enough challenges, you know, that, that they're being faced with that, uh, you know, what what's... I get what's, I suppose what I'm kind of rambling towards, what's the minimum effective dose, if you will, uh, that they can um, supply to their children to help them um, both retain and, and improve in some of these areas. So uh, for the more, for the more, I guess, um, um, science inclined or experimentally inclined uh, parents, uh, I want to come back just to this, this idea of um, the, uh, the rate of response, as as you know, what we're looking at here in terms of the um, the aim, and so you know, we had the whole discussion about okay, what's the what's the appropriate length of a timing and yada yada yada. So just to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, so our our listeners can apply this in a way that that makes some logical sense. So basically, if let's say someone settled on thirty seconds for whatever you know whatever skill they're they're working on as the timing. And they're mm-hmm. measuring the number correct and number incorrect in that yep. thirty second timing uh, to basically what the, the the I know there's a number of different ways to do this. I know some people will repeat that twice and then add everything up to get the total number of correct and the total number incorrect for a full per minute. Mm. Um, okay. I've, I've I've heard that, but I've heard just people just kind of multiplying by two. That's what I do. Okay. Yeah. So yep. if you're if you do a thirty second timing, you 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 multiply the correct and incorrect by two to get your your per minute. Um, or if you're doing a twenty second timing, you multiply by three and so on and mm-hmm. so forth. So is that is that how what you would recommend? Yep, that's what I do. So um, I when <laughs> yeah, you you get really good at multiplying by twos, threes, and fours because. <laughs> 30 second timing, 20 second timing, and 15 second timing. If you're doing a 10 second timing, you multiply by six to get to 60 seconds. So right. that's how it works. It's just uh, kind of what fraction of a minute is that? And then to get your per minute score, you just multiply it by whatever that is. Um, so, so just to, just to recap, so aims are expressed as per minute uh, and we want to have some something to compare apples and apples. And that's why you would do those multiplications. Yeah, and precision teachers are starting to um, report aims based on kind of the the ultimate counting time. So, how at what timing length are they supposed to be at this at this score? Um, and so, hopefully, over time, we'll start to see that too. So it'll be more like aims will be expressed more like X number in thirty seconds or X number in twenty seconds is your ultimate goal. Um, or in two minutes or whatever, as opposed to just a per minute count that everybody has to multiply. Um, so any of those, most of the aims you'll be able to find on the resources that I shared are, are expressed in per minute. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm just looking through our, our yeah, bullet points here. Point yeah. Yeah. Well. I'm just going to ask you if there are other points you want to make. Yeah. Go right yeah. ahead. In, in this kind of frequency building paradigm, like I said, it's the, you actually kind of do the same activity a few times in a row. You time it, give feedback, do extra practice, whatever, then try it again. See if you beat your score or your speed. Um, and then kind of once you've hit your best for the day or your, um, or you need a break, <laughs> whatever, whatever you reach, um, different precision teaching organizations have different rules about that as well. Like maybe you set a timer for 10 minutes, a separate timer than the one that you're doing timings with. And you say, we're going to work on this for 10 minutes, no matter what. Um, so you either go, you either go until you hit your best score ever, um, your personal best or your, your personal record, whatever you want to call it. Kids always have funny names for these things. Um, you're rocking timing. I've had kids say that. 
Uh, so you go for your rock in timing. And if you get your best score for the day, then you're done with that activity for the day and you can move on to a different one or maybe that's the only one you're doing. So it can, it can happen in the period of, you know, however long it takes to get to that score or 10 minutes, whichever one comes first. Um, but I wouldn't recommend, I, I want to make sure that it's clear that I don't recommend doing this over and over and over again until your kid like can't even look at math facts anymore. If that's what you're working on. Um, and that this is a way to have really, really focused work for a very short amount of time. So it's kind of like, you know, a, a, an explosive workout, if you will. It's, it's, it's something that you can just, let's just as a family take 20 minutes, do our timings for the day or our fluency block or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, or our, you know, mad minutes, I don't know. Uh, let's do that. And then we're done. Um, and that can be more efficient for learning. If you just do that consistently over a few days of the week, that can be more efficient than like sitting down and spending multiple hours on a worksheet um, or, you know, trying to drone on about some math concept or something. So that can really save your sanity <laughs> is just organize your time for a short amount of time, pick, you know, two or three things that you want to do timings on based on your kid's biggest area of need or interest or whatever it is and just do that. So I think that would be a really cool way to bolster their skills without totally draining everybody's energy and taking out too much time of your day that you probably have to work from home. So I wanted to make sure to make that clear too. Oh, that's an excellent point. And uh, yeah, so, um, all right, cool. I, I think, uh, again, I, you included a whole host of resources where people get educational materials. We talked about how to we kind of made the case for teaching in this way. Um, we talked about how to do it, how to take take some inf- you know some scores, if you will, or data. Um, is there anything else that you want to touch on for the time being? I know we can. There's a bunch of different directions we could probably get all sidetracked in, but for the time yeah. being, um, <laughs> in terms of just kind of an introductory uh, exposure to this this way of of teaching, especially in this very unique context. Um, let me know if there's anything else that, uh, that you have to add. Um, I think just a, a quick note on the materials. I sent you a list of materials that I've personally used. Some of them, most of them have nothing to do with precision teaching, but, um, or, or frequency building even, but I've been able to use those materials and modify them. There's a few that are printable. So you can kind of keep your kids away from screens for this amount of time. There's another few that are really good for, you know, Delta Math and EdReady, even Khan Academy are really good for older learners where you don't even know how to teach them because they're doing some weird thing with algebra. That at least can help you help them because there's explanations and multiple problem sets and some worked problems. So I find those really useful as a, as a math tutor, especially um, but when working with older kids, I find those really useful. And right now there's, there's at least a free trial, if not a way to get access um, for free because of the, the situation that we're in currently. So I wanted to make, make that clear. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of materials being posted. And I do want to give a big shout out to our community of behavior analysts, speech and language pathologists, precision teachers special educators who have put out all these amazing lists of materials and resources and a bunch of ed tech companies are providing things for free for a short amount of time. And I think that's really amazing. Um, So my list isn't comprehensive. It's just things that I tend to use that I find useful for um, creating those materials for timings um, and for making sure to kind of work through systematically um, certain areas of study. Uh, but there's a ton of stuff out there. So I'm, I'm sure that everyone's going to find lots of things on the internet right now. Um, but those are the things that I wanted to say about the materials that I'm putting out. They're things that I, that I know are evidence-based, are usable for these kinds of things or created for this kind of activity. Awesome. This has been really helpful and I appreciate you taking some time. I'm sure you've got a lot of people trying to track you down and get additional support uh, again during these times that are just uh, so unprecedented and so unusual. So uh, Amy, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. This is so super fun. 
thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.